Thank you all very much for coming out today to celebrate with the co-op uh, the opening of its new location. Our MC today is uh, Ian Desai. I remember Ian when he joined the cooperative in, 19, no, in 2000 as a first year student in the college. He, uh, four years later, he graduated as a Rhodes Scholar and he's now come back to the university on the faculty, purchasing books from the co-op once again, <laughs> and in the process of writing a book that we'll be selling. The perfect customer, <laughs> Ian Desai. Thank you. It's so wonderful to be here. This is a marvelous occasion, and I'm so thrilled. Um, a few people I've told who I, uh, I said I would be introducing our keynote speaker, uh, and I'll actually be introducing Jack uh, after our keynote speaker, asked me, uh, how, how could that be? How was I qualified? All I could come up and say is that I, I'm one of the co-op's top groupies. Um, but the rest of you are all in the room, so um, so my qualifications fade away. Normally, I speak extemporaneously, but uh, I'm so kind of excited and nervous about this occasion that I've written out uh, the introduction for our keynote speaker, Alexander Heyman, uh, and I'm going to read that now. Alexander Heyman was born in Sarajevo and visited Chicago in 1992, intending to stay for a matter of months. While he was here, Sarajevo came under siege, and he was unable to return home. Heyman wrote his first story in English in 1995. Since then, he has published five books to tremendous acclaim around the world. He was awarded a Guggenheim Fellowship in 2003 and a Genius Grant from the MacArthur Foundation in 2004. In 2011, Heyman was awarded the Penn W.G. Zabald Award. Most importantly for today's occasion, he's a longtime member of the co-op and, I think, the perfect choice to speak on this exciting day in our bookstore's history. Alexander Heyman first came to me the way the best things in life do, through a friend. It was around the time that I graduated from the U of C and a close friend of mine, himself a writer, started telling me about Heyman and his books. I should read them and I should meet him. Little explanation followed, but these exhortations were repeated regularly. As has often been the case in my life, I was slow on the uptake. No matter, my friend never tired of recommended Heyman to me always with the joint proviso that I ought to read him and I ought to meet him. He was a great writer and a wonderful person. As I am sure many in this room know, certain books and authors will elude readers, despite the best recommendations of their friends, for some time, and then suddenly appear and enter our hands and our lives at exactly the right moment. Occasionally, a book or an author will find us this way and change us forever. This is what happened to me when I finally made good on my friend's advice and began reading Heyman. What Heyman has written about playing soccer, I now feel about reading his books. I have the pleasant, this is his, these are his words, quote, I have the pleasant, tingling sensation of being connected with something bigger and better than me. That is the force of the grace, intelligence, and detailed grandeur in his writing. It is no coincidence that my long-winded discovery of Heyman was finally completed only after I had moved back to Hyde Park after eight years away. Why? Because when a reader is ready for a book, and a book is ready for a reader, there is still one crucial thing that needs to happen. They need to be brought together. They need a bridge to each other. They need a bookstore. <laughs> Luckily, for those of us in Hyde Park, we have a few of those. I now own four of Heyman's five books, The Question of Bruno, Nowhere Man, which was a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award, Love and Other Obstacles, and his most recent book, The Book of My Lives. The first I bought at 57 Street Books, the second and third at O'Gara and Wilson's further east on 57 Street, and The Book of My Lives, I bought that one right here at the co-op. I was planning to buy The Lazarus Project, which was a finalist for the National Book Award and the National Book Critics Circle Award at Powell's, but at Powell's to properly round the bases of our neighborhood's bookstores. But I think with the glee and excitement of today uh, at this grand opening, uh, it means I'm going to walk out of here this afternoon with that one too. I now teach Heyman's work in my core class 
uh, in world literature here at the University of Chicago. What I say to my students, colleagues, and friends about Sandor Morai or Borges or Annie Proulx, I say about Haman, as my friend said to me, read this. You have to read this. I want to have one uh, off-the-cuff story. I, I was in a plane once um, uh, w next to a woman who was reading on an iPad, and uh, I got into a conversation um, about the, the merits of the iPod and digital reading and things like that. And she was showing me how wonderful it was that the book had a video embedded in it, uh, and you could play the video and then continue reading the book. Um, and, and, and I went back to, to my reading, um, and, and we kind of kept going back and forth. And obviously, I'm still unconvinced about um, uh, the book in digital form. Um, but this, this uh, stranger next to me was clearly quite convinced. And then came that moment at the end of the flight where they asked everybody to turn off their electronic devices. <laughs> and she turned hers off, and I kept reading. And then she looked over, and she said, well, I guess <laughs> you do have the advantage over me here. Uh, so I reached into my backpack uh, a, a few minutes later, and I pulled out two books at random. I, I, I told her I carry about 15 books whenever I'm traveling. I, I pulled out two books uh, just at random, blindly. One of them was Candide. The other was Alexander's um, The Question of Bruno. And I handed them both to her as, a, as an offering. Uh, she put Candide aside. She took The Question of Bruno. And uh, I sat there reading, hearing the pages flip and flip and flip, and then as the plane got into a holding pattern over Chicago, continue to flip and flip. Um, suffice it to say, uh, books, uh, strangers, readers, friends, uh, all served each other uh, on that moment um, uh, in the way that this uh, bookstore serves all of us all the time. It gives me great pleasure to invite to the stage a sublime Chicago author, a world author, and above all, a friendly and irresistibly human, despite this picture of an alien on the cover of his book, an irresistibly human author, Alexander Heyman. Thank you. That was very um, generous on your part. Strangely, I was, not strangely, but it makes perfect sense. As I was driving down here, I thought, I had the exact same thought as, as Ian, that in the end, people need to get together around books physically. Um, and this is why electronic books will never take over entirely. They, you know, convenient and and uh, gadgety. Um, but in the end, we have to be in the same room or in the same tent, sweating. Um, and, and there's something indelible about the physicality um, of the book. Um, so I'm I'm glad they exist. It's also that uh, I've never in my life seen anyone reading my book. <laughs> It is true. I, I, you know, when I ever see someone reading, I, I well, outside of bookstores, that, that, that's the point. But on, you know, subways and trains and airplanes, and I travel a lot and use a lot of public transportation, not once did I see anyone reading my book. And for a while I thought, you know, people who show up at readings might be paid by my publisher to encourage me along. But uh, now there are too many people showing up. And if it's my publisher's arrangement, thank you very much. <laughs> for paying all these extras. Um, um, I was thinking about um, co-op and thinking how we need to get together and how, you know, bookstore is a wonderful, any bookstore is a wonderful place, but of course, old co-op seminary was, um, was a wonderful place because you had to be very committed to those books to descend into that basement <laughs> and bang your hands against the pipes and then when it got hot, you would, you know, flip through them, you wouldn't be able to leave in your winter coat and sweating profusely in the spirit of the old seminary we sweat now. Uh, and how it was really, there was some, something monastic about it, not least because, you know, it was part of sem the seminary. So the dedication to books, it's not just, um, it's not, the books can never be just entertainment. Um, Kindle and electronic devices, they're prone to books that are, well, entertainment, so that when you read them, you can delete them. Uh, but, and so there are books that, that serve as uh, social glue in the widest sense. So everyone has to have read some big name, say, Fifty Shades of Grey. I failed to join that particular group. Uh, so that there's a social conversation going on around that. But there are particular books, and I have said I'm more fond of those books, that 
do not spread, um, do not um, circulate in vast social groups. But they're small groups of uh, readers. Obviously, university or academic books and university press books, they uh, address small audiences. But it's also in terms of uh, literary uh, fiction or art of narration, I've, I've always gravitated toward the books that um, that you could find in the corners of Seminary Cop, and they would have them. They would have all of those books. There was the front table, of course, but it wasn't that big. But the, the books in the far corners are the books that I went looking for, and not just, obviously, Fiction. There were um, there was philosophy, history. There still is, you know, just in different location. All these books that made me feel when I entered the bookstore that a discovery was at hand of some sort. There are bookstores you go to, and Amazon has taken over those bookstores where you go to to get a book that you want. Right? It's they easy. Uh, the, the convenience of Amazon or the front table in and. Uh, chain bookstores, is it's, it's going to be there. You just go there, get it, and get out. But a bookstore like sem the seminary and co-op, 57th Street Co-op, requires spending time there, spending time in the space with the books and other people, and, and pulls you, pulls me toward a discovery. I want to go to the far corners and look, what's, look for what's there, whatever it is. Books that I don't even know exist. Topics and themes that I had not thought about until I saw the book. It's an entirely different way of in, engaging with books and, uh, and other readers. And for this, um, we need physical books. We need material books. We, and we need human beings rather than just, just email. So to me, I was, I, when I was kindly asked to contribute to this grand opening, I was more than happy to do so, to be associated with the Seminary Co-op, but also to uh, support this great project of a bookstore. And, uh, um, in that spirit, um, I have to say, it's a bit of gloating, but as we were coming down on 53rd Street, Borders was gone. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember when Borders opened my first um, on 53rd and, uh, what is it, uh, Lakeshore? Lake, Lake Park, sorry, yeah. Um, that I was worried that it would you know, affect uh, um, the seminary and also 57th Street uh, co-op, that they would be hurt and be gone. And to me, there was an insufferable possibility. But lo and behold, borders and the front table are gone. <laughs> so let's um, gloat for a minute about that. It's all right. <laughs> now I'll read from the book of my lives um, two little pieces. One from a, um, a piece on soccer, which is entitled, If God Existed, He'd Be a Solid Midfielder. <laughs> Now, the proper title should be, if God existed, he would be a solid holding midfielder, but I thought it would be too recondite for those who do not play soccer. Um, so I'll read a little bit from this piece and then read another piece. And then, um, I don't know if questions and answers are expected, but probably not. We'll just move on to celebrate um, the, the uh, grand opening of the seminary, but I'll be a, uh, happy to hang out and answer questions and sign books. All right, if God existed, he'd be a solid midfielder. By Bosnian standards, I'd been an athletic person, even though I'd for years smoked a pack and a half a day, had started enjoying alcoholic potions at the ripe age of 15, and was fully dependent on a red meat and fat diet. I'd played soccer on the gravel and parking lots of Sarajevo once or twice a week since time immemorial. But soon after my landing in Chicago, I gained weight due to nutrition based on Whoppers and Twinkies, <laughs> exacerbated by a series of torturous attempts to quit smoking. Furthermore, I couldn't find anybody to play with. My Greenpeace friends deemed rolling joints as physical exercise <laughs> and only occasionally arranged a lazy softball game where no score was kept and everyone was doing great all the time. <laughs> I couldn't get past understanding the rules, but I did stubbornly try to keep score. Not playing soccer tormented me. I didn't really care about being healthy as I was still young enough. For me, playing soccer was closely related to being fully alive. Without soccer, I felt at sea, mentally and physically. One Saturday in the summer of 1995, I was riding my bike by a lakeside field in Chicago's uptown and saw people warming up kicking the ball around while waiting for the game to start. It seemed they might have 
been getting ready for a league game for which you had to have registered as a member of a team. But before I had time to consider the humiliating prospect of rejection, I asked if I could join them. Sure, they said, and I kicked the ball for the first time after an eternity of three years. That day, I finally played 25 pounds heavier, wearing denim cutoffs and basketball shoes. In no time, I pulled my groin and quickly earned blisters on my soles. I humbly played defense, although I used to be a forward, and strictly obeyed the commands of the best and fastest player on my team, one Philip, who had been, I learned later, on the Nigerian four times 400 relay team at the Seoul Olympics. After the game, I asked Philip if I could come back. Ask that guy, Philip said and pointed at the ref. The ref wore a striped black and white shirt and introduced himself as German. He told me there was a game every Saturday and Sunday and I could always come. German was not in fact German. He was from Ecuador, but his father was born in Germany, hence his name, Hermann, and a nickname. He worked as a UPS truck driver and was in his mid-40s, suntanned, wearing a modest pompadour and a mustache. Every Saturday and Sunday, he'd arrive by the lake around 2 p.m. in a decrepit 20-some-year-old van on which a soccer ball and the words, kick me, make my day, were painted. <laughs> He'd unload goalposts made from plastic pipes and nets, bagfuls of single-color t-shirts and balls. He distributed the shirts to the guys who came to play, put a board on the garbage can, and on top of it a number of cheap cups and trophies, little flags of different countries, and a radio blaring Spanish language stations. Most of the players lived in Uptown and Edgewater and came from Mexico, Honduras, El Salvador, Peru, Chile, Colombia, Belize, Brazil, Jamaica, Nigeria, Somalia, Ethiopia, Senegal, Eritrea, Ghana, Cameroon, Morocco, Algeria, Jordan, France, Spain, Romania, Bulgaria, Bosnia, the USA, Ukraine, Russia, France, Vietnam, Korea, etc. <laughs> there was even a guy from Tibet, and he was a very good goalie. Normally, there'd be more than two teams, and they all had to rotate, so each game lasted for 15 minutes or until one team scored two goals. The games were very serious and contentious, as the winning team stayed on the field for the next game, while the losing one had to wait on the sidelines for its turn to come back on. German ref refereed, and he almost never called a foul. He'd follow the game with glazed eyes as though watching soccer made him high. It seemed he needed to hear the sound of a breaking bone to use his whistle. <laughs> it's true. Sometimes, if a team was a player short, he'd referee and play simultaneously. <laughs> In such a situation, he was particularly hard on himself and once gave himself a yellow card for a rough time. <laughs> it's true. We immigrants trying to stay afloat in this country found comfort in playing by the rules we set ourselves. It made us feel that we still were a part of the world much bigger than the USA. People acquire their nicknames based on, the on their country of origin. For a while, I was Bosnia and would often find myself playing in the midfield with, say, Colombia and Romania. <laughs> Ever hurting to play and fearing that I'd be left out if I was late, I'd often be the first one to arrive before games. I'd help German set up the goals and then hang out with him and others talking soccer. In his magic van, German had albums of photos in which people who had played with him were recorded. I could recognize some of the guys when they were much younger. One of them, whom everyone called Brazil, told me he had been playing with German for more than 20 years. German had been the one or had been the one organizing games from the beginning, although it had some drug and booze problems and had taken a few years off at one point. But he came back, Brazil said. I understood for the first time, first time since my arrival that it was possible to live in this country and still have a past shared with other people. It wasn't clear to me why German was doing it all. Even though I like to think of myself as a reasonably generous person, I could never imagine spending every single weekend putting together soccer games and refereeing, subjecting myself to verbal and other abuse, dismantling the goals and loading up the van long after everybody had left, then washing a large number of t-shirts stinky with worldly sweat. It was clear that the 
that without German, those pickup games would not be happening, but he never asked for anything in return from us. I abused for years German's inexplicable generosity, as we often played in the winter in a church gym in Pilsen, which was beyond the reach of my bike, I'd catch a ride in his clunky kick-me-make-my-day van, holding the passenger to the side door whose log didn't work. On the way back, I often feared for my life, as German was prone to celebrating the successful completion of yet another game with a few beers. He always had a well-stocked cooler in his van. He'd talk incessantly, driving and sipping beer, telling me about his favorite team of all time, the Cameroon of the 1990 World Cup, or about his search for an heir, someone who'd continue organizing the games once he retired and moved to Florida. He had a hard time finding the right people, he said, because few people had the guts to commit. He never suggested that I take over, which slightly offended me, even if I knew that gutless as I was, I'd never be able to do it. Once, during a blood-curdling ride home on the icy streets of Chicago, I asked him why he was doing it all. He was doing it for God, he said. God had instructed him to put people together, to spread his love, and that became his mission. I was uncomfortable, afraid that, ha that he might be proselytized, that he might proselytize, so I didn't ask him anything beyond that. But he never asked people about their religion, never flaunted his faith, never tried to call them to the Lord. His faith in soccer was unconditional. People's belief in the game was enough for him. He told me that after his retirement, he was planning to buy a piece of land in Florida and build a church and put a soccer field next to it. He was planning to spend the rest of his life preaching. After the sermons, his flock would play and he would referee. A few years after that conversation, at the end of the summer, German retired. One of the last weekends before he stopped showing up by the lake, we were playing in sweltering heat. Everybody was testy. Hummingbird-sized flies were ravenous. The field was hard, humidity high, humidity low. A few scuffles broke out. The sky was darkening over the line of skyscrapers along Lakeshore Drive, rain simmering in the clouds, about to boil over. And then a cold front hit us, as if somebody had opened a gigantic cooler, and rain arrived abruptly. I'd never seen anything like that. The rain started at the other end of the field and then moved across it toward the far goal, steadily advancing like a German World Cup team. <laughs> we bolted away from the rain, but it quickly caught up with us, and in no time, we were soaked. There was something terrifying, terrifying about the blind power of the sudden weather shift, about its violent randomness. As rain washed in waves over us, nothing depended on our minds or wills. I ran toward German's van as toward an ark, escaping the flood. There were other guys there already, German, Max from Belize, a man from Chile, consequently known as Chile, Rodrigo, German's mechanic who miraculously kept the van alive for more than 20 years, and Rodrigo's droopy, bare-chested buddy, who didn't seem to speak English at all, sitting on the cooler, occasionally handing out beers. We took shelter in the van. The rain clattered against the roof as though we were in a coffin, somebody dropping shovelfuls of dirt on us. So I asked German if he thought he'd be able to find people to play with in Florida. He was sure he'd find somebody, he said, for if you gave and asked for nothing in return, somebody was bound to take it. Suddenly inspired, Chile rambled off something that seemed to be a badly learned lesson from a new age manual, something vapid about unconditional surrender. People in Florida are too old and they can't run, I said. <laughs> it's somewhat prejudicial. <laughs> if they're old, German said, they are close to entering eternity and what they need is hope and courage. Soccer would help them on the way of eternal life, he said, on the way to eternal life. Now I am an atheist man, vain and cautious. I give little, expect a lot, and ask for more. What he was saying seemed far too heavy, naive, and simplistic. It would have, in fact, seemed heavy, naive, and simplistic if the following was not taking place. Hakim, the Nigerian who somehow found a way to play soccer every day of his life, runs up soaked to the van and asks us if we've seen his keys. Are you out of your mind, we say, as the rain is pouring through the window? Can't you see it's the end of the fucking world? Look for your keys later. Kids, he says, I'm looking for my kids. 
<laughs> then we watch Hakim running through the rain, collecting his two terrified kids hiding under a tree. He moves like a shadow against the intensely gray curtain of rain, the kids hanging on his chest like little koalas. Meanwhile, on the bike path, Lalas, nicknamed after the American soccer player, stands beside his wife, who is in a wheelchair. She has a horrific case of fast advancing MS and cannot move fast enough to get out of the rain. They stand together, waiting for the calamity to end. Lalas, in his Uptown United t-shirt, his wife under a piece of cardboard slowly and irreversibly dissolving in the rain. The Tibetan goalie and his Tibetan friends, who might never seen before and never would ever, never would after that day, are playing a game on the field, which is now completely covered with water, as if running in slow motion on the surface of a placid river. The ground is giving off vapor, the mist touching their ankles, and at moments it seems that they're levitating above the flood. Lalas and his wife are perfectly calm watching them, as if nothing could ever harm them. She has passed away since that day. Somebody rest her soul. They see one of the Tibetans scoring a goal, the rain, heavy ball, uh, the rain heavy ball sliding between the hands of the goalie who lands in a puddle. He's in trouble, smiling, and from where I sit, he could well be the Dalai Lama himself. So this, ladies and gentlemen, is what this little narrative is about. The rare moment of transcendence that might be familiar to those who play sports with other people. The moment arising from the chaos of the game when all your teammates occupy an ideal position on the field. The moment when the universe seems to be arranged by a meaningful will that is not yours. The moment that perishes, as moments tend to, when you complete a pass. And all you are left with is a vague, physical, orgasmic memory of the evanescent instant when you were completely connected with everything and everyone around you. That's the piece about soccer. Thank you. Um, I'll read a short piece um, called Sound and Vision. My father's in the audience, and he'll remember some of these events. My father spent a couple of years in Zaire in the early 80s, constructing Kinshasa's electric grid, while mother, my sister Christina, and I stayed at home in Sarajevo. In the summer of 19, 1982, he came back home to take us to Zaire for a six-week vacation whose highlight would be a safari. I was 17, Christina four years younger. We'd never been abroad, so we spent sleepless nights imagining everything we would experience that summer. The days, however, I spent watching the Soccer World Cup as I'd vetoed the possibility of going anywhere before the tournament was over. Once Yugoslavia was, as usual, eliminated early and embarrassingly, I became heavily invested in the Italian team. A couple of days before we left, I cheered for Italy in the World Cup finals in which they beautifully beat Germany 3-1. The World Cup over, we were on our way to Africa. The first stop was Italy, as we were supposed to catch an Air Zaire flight to Kinshasa at Rome's Fiumicino airport. At the airport, we discovered that the flight had been canceled without explanation and until further notice. Father handled it all. He argued with the, Zaire, the Air Zaire representatives. He retrieved our suitcases. He showed our passports to the Italian border control officer. We were to wait for our flight at a hotel in a nearby town, to which we took a crowded shuttle. Christina and I were impatient to see what all the brouhaha over being abroad was about. What we saw during the shuttle ride was not all that impressive. Nondescript buildings, flying Italian flags, shop windows sporting pictures of the national soccer team, the Azzurri. Ever a great wrangler of silver linings, father promised us that we would go to Rome, which was half an hour away by train, as soon as we had settled in the hotel. He was our leader in this foreign world. He spoke in stern and bad English to the airport staff. He located the shuttle and got us on board. He exchanged money and dispensed it from his little man purse with the confidence of a man used to international currencies. Christina and I proudly bore witness to his negotiating two rooms for the Hemon family. He was conspicuously tall in his azure shirt, winking at us, entirely comfortable with all the worldly matters at hand. 
But then, suddenly, dark fields of sweat appeared on his shirt, and he started frantically pacing the lobby. His man purse was gone. He ran outside to see if he had left it in the shuttle, but the shuttle, too, was gone. In garbled English, he yelled at the receptionist. He randomly interrogated guests and service staff who happened to enter the lobby. His shirt was now covered with sweat. He reeked of an imminent heart attack. Mother was also here now, who had previously idled in the lobby, flipping a Rubik's Cube, tried to calm him down. We still had the passport, she said. It was only our cash that had been stolen. Coming from the promised land of socialism, we had no credit cards. <laughs> Several thousand American dollars, Christina and I realized in horror, all of our vacation money. Thus we found ourselves penniless in an obscure Italian town, unable to go to Rome for a day trip, let alone to Africa for a safari. The possibility of our simply giving up on being abroad and returning to Sarajevo was real and devastating. The hotel looked at a long wall over which ugly, thirsty trees peeked at the displaced tourists. Father was on the hotel phone making calls, informing his co-workers in Zaire that we were stuck without money somewhere in Italy, hoping that they could help him get the hell out of it or find a way back to Sarajevo or on to Zaire. In the process, he found out that the Kinshasa flight had been canceled because a Zairean army general had kicked the bucket and the, di the dictator, Mobutu, had requisi requisitioned all three Air Zaire intercontinental aircraft to fly his large entourage to the funeral. My mouth is dry, give me a minute. The next day, Father was still obsessively analyzing every moment of the unfortunate trip from the airport to the reception desk, retracing his every step to determine at which point the clever thief struck, which would help identify him. Running out of clean shirts, he eventually came to the conclusion that the theft had taken place at a reception desk and reconstructed the full sequence of events. Father had put his man purse down on the counter while filling out the forms, and when he turned to wink at us, the receptionist had slipped it under the desk. Consequently, Father installed himself in the lobby, intently monitoring the receptionist, a handsome, innocent-looking young man, and waiting for him to make a revealing mistake. Christina and I had nothing to do. We listened to our Walkman, shareable because it had two outlets for earphones. We tried to watch television in our room, but even the movies were dubbed in Italian, although that afforded us a precious sight of John Wayne walking into a saloon full of bad guys and saying, Buongiorno. <laughs> We wandered around the nameless town, excited in spite of everything, to be experiencing the world. There was the vague smell of the Mediterranean, as if the town were on the sea. The lush variety of design in the pasta store around the corner, the intense redness of the tomatoes and the din of bartering at the local market. Shops packed with the things that socialist teenagers coveted rock music, then imploding gelato. Taverns full of loud men watching replays of the World Cup games and reliving the triumph. I wanted to watch the finals all over again to see Marco Tardelli screaming in celebration after scoring the second goal, but Cristina objected. When everything shut down for the noon siesta, we trailed a group of suntanned young people assuming that their final destination was fun until we ended up on an entirely unanticipated beach. It turned out the town was called Ostia and that it was in fact on the coast. Returning from our expedition, eager to deliver the good news, Christina and I found Father sweating like a hysterical hog and glaring at the receptionist from a far corner of the lobby, a veritable self-appointed hotel detective. <laughs> Even after a couple of shifts on the watch, he'd failed to catch the suspect in another act of stealing or to collect any evidence against him. From where we stood, his aura of leadership was somewhat diminished. When we announced that we'd discovered salt water, Mother finally abandoned her Rubik's Cube and took charge. First, we went with her to a jewelry store we came upon around the corner where she sold her favorite gold necklace after a hard bargain. Then she distributed the money. Father, for obvious reasons, did not get any at the time. <laughs> <laughs> Christina and I instantly went to the music store where we'd already browsed. We pulled our money to buy a cassette tape of David Bowie's Low. <laughs> When we came back with our treasure, Mother informed us that we were required to participate in an evening family walk. I still cherish the memory, which fully contains all the smells, sounds, and visions from the evening when the Hemons leisurely strolled along the Lido as if on vacation, 
the parents holding hands as if in love, the children licking gelato paid for with family gold. In the middle of, of a catastrophe, the Hemons managed to scrounge up some makeshift joy. The following day, father told us that we would fly to Brussels where we could catch an evening flight to Kinshasa. The general buried, Mobutu had released the aircraft. As we left the hotel, father shot one last glance of sublime hatred on, at the receptionist, <laughs> but Christina and I were strangely sad to be leaving. On a building across the street from the hotel, a passionate soccer tifoso had draped a vast flag, the same shade of blue as my father's sweat-stained shirt, which read Grazie Azzurri. <laughs> we spent a day in Brussels, admiring resplendent duty-free shops and spotless bathrooms. In the evening, we were finally on the flight to Africa. Attached at the Walkman, Christina and I listened to Bowie's beautiful album. Flying along the dividing line between night and sunset, on one side, we could see complete darkness, and on the other, horizon in spectacular flames. In Ostia, something had awoken in us, and lo, was the soundtrack for what we were changed, experiencing. That night, we could not sleep at all, flipping the cassette back and forth until the batteries ran out. Don't you wonder sometimes, sang Bowie all the way to Kinshasa, about sound and vision. Thank you. Thank you. That was perfect, as, as we suspected. Thank you. Um, now it's my great honor to introduce Jack Sella. Uh, the introduction uh, will be longer than what he has to say. Um, I, I asked him what I should say about him, and he said nothing, in which case the introduction would be shorter than what he has to say. Um, but I, I, um, I decided to uh, kind of fight my way through this challenge of how you introduce one of the most self-effacing people uh, around. Um, I, I talked to his colleagues, some of whom have worked with him for 35 years, uh, to try to ascertain where Jack went to college, uh, and I, we couldn't figure it out. Uh, all, all that's known is that he uh, appeared at the University of Chicago at the Div School um, around 1968, started working at the bookstore shortly thereafter, and according to him, sometime around 1970, became the manager of the seminary co-op. Um, the the co-op, both in its old location and its new location, uh, has been called uh, the heart and soul of the University of Chicago, or just simply the University of Chicago. Um, I, I, I feel the same way about it. And, and Jack has been called the heart and soul uh, of the seminary co-op, or just simply the seminary co-op. Um, I think th those equivalences uh, uh, hold. Um, so one way to get around um, trying to find out about the, the self-effacing man is just to hang out at the co-op for a long time, uh, which, which I do, and, and you'll inevitably start to accumulate some Jack stories. I'm going to tell you just the, my first Jack story, um, and, and it, it, uh, it's of a type with, with many of them that are, that are about uh, incredible, remarkable help uh, and, and the most uh, caring bookseller uh, in the world, but I'll get more to that later. Um, so I, I, I'd come back to Chicago after graduating, and every time I came back to Chicago, I'd visit the bookstore. I didn't feel like I had come to Chicago if I didn't visit the bookstore. And I remember seeing, I had left Chicago, I remember seeing a book on the front table that looked uh, interesting to me. And I knew where it was on the front table. Uh, it was, it was, if you walked in in the old co-op, it was um, just in the kind of uh, uh, northwest corner of the table. And something about a web and birds and, but it was a history book, and it we had a kind of greenish-yellow cover. And that's all. I didn't know the title. I didn't know the author. I didn't really know the subject. But I remember it had been of interest to me, and I called Jack up, and I said, Jack, could you help me find this book? I don't have a name. I don't have a, uh, an author. Um, I don't know anything about it except where it was on the front table about four months ago and, and what it approximately looks like. Um, sure enough, he found the book. 
Uh, it's called The Human Web. It's, um, uh, the subtitle is A Bird's Eye View of uh, World History. It's by uh, the, the uh, father and son McNeil team. Uh, and uh, now, Jack, I was hoping to bring it in for this for show and tell. I have looked everywhere in my house, and I cannot find it. So out of options, I was going to turn to you and ask you if you know where my copy of The Human Web is. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. So the, I, the actually I think for me the 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 most direct connection to to introducing Jack is actually through um, uh, my own research um, on Mahatma Gandhi's secretary. He's a man named Mahadev Desai. He's not related to me, um, but Mahadev Desai was at Gandhi's side for. Uh, 25 years of his life. He died at age 50, so half his life he spent in service to Gandhi. Um, he got up before Gandhi to prepare his day. He spent the entire day with Gandhi and then stayed up afterwards to write an account of Gandhi's life. Um, the diaries of Mahadev Desai run to 26 volumes, but they're all about Gandhi. We know almost nothing about uh, Mahadev Desai. The collected works of Gandhi are a hundred volumes, but Mahadev Desai is barely mentioned there because you don't write letters to the person who is sitting there next to you taking notes and effacing all traces of themselves. So I I'm writing a book right now on Gandhi and Desai's joint library, and I've been kind of trying to trace Desai back out through, through the books. Jack Sella is one of these Mahadev Desai uh, characters in human history, the people who make the world happen but we can't quite see, the people who take their stories off the stage while giving us every other story that we could imagine. Um, and, and I think that's, uh, that's the way I've come to think of Jack. That's the way I've come to think of his staff. That's why you, you, you don't want to, uh, he doesn't want you to say anything in an introduction, but really the introduction, just go walk into the grand opening of the bookstore and behind every one of those books is Jack Sella. Um, that's all you need to know. I'm so happy to be part of this uh, grand opening. This store is about community. It's about bringing people and books together in a way that makes us all better, in, in a way that makes all of our lives better. Um, as Virginia Woolf says in A Room of One's Own with such force and panache, books beget books. Words from a great author explode into readers' minds and inspire them to create their own books. No bookstore in the world brings readers and writers together with better results than the seminary co-op. Friends, fellow co-op members, the general manager of the best bookstore in the world, Jack Sella. That was very generous, Ian, and thank you. And thank you all for coming. I, I think we're trying to celebrate a couple of things today, at least. Um, one, we're, we want to celebrate the co-op's move into this new location, to my right here. After 51 years in the basement of the building uh, a block away, we're now above ground, uh, natural light, much better temperature control, completely accessible. Uh, and we still have pipes, but you're never going to hit your head on any of them. <laughs> and there are many, many people to thank who were responsible for this move. And I, first, I think I want to thank the University of Chicago and everybody at the university who participated in this move, this effort. Um, it was a very... Everybody we talked to for two years was supportive, interested, and I think genuinely enthusiastic about the move of, of the co-op, uh, from funding it to thinking about what it should be. But the enthusiasm came through in every single conversation. And I, I could name all sorts of people, but I think the list would go on and be exceptionally boring. But I think all of you know who you are. And I think from all of us, I want to thank the University of Chicago and the people who make it up. Uh, and secondly, uh, I want to thank Stanley Tigerman and Margaret McCurry. Stanley and Margaret were the architects who designed the space. Um, we, several of us from the co-op, met with them every other week for well over a year um, as we worked together to come up with a spot that would sort of bring to a new location what people said they liked about the cooperative and leave behind things they said they didn't like. 
And uh, I, I really think Stanley and Margaret and their team at Tigerman and McCurry have done a spectacular job at transport, at, at re really recreating a new, a new space. When we talk about architecture, we read about architecture as a, uh, a melding of the arts and the sciences, and it's just sort of unique in that. But really, I've never seen it in action uh, before as it was in action when Stanley and Margaret talked about what the co-op could be in a new location. They, the university was very, very generous in its support, but we still had a budget. We had to, we had to work under. Um, there were several instances where, instances where Stanley would be very excited about something and said, this is really what we should do. And Margaret would put her hand on his arm and say, Stanley, calm down. We have to think about how much it would cost. But the end result is really, is really spectacular. And I think all of us uh, who value bookstores and should really thank Stanley and Margaret and their team for the work they did on this. And I, and I think the second thing we really want to celebrate today is uh, the bookstore's customers, their shareholders, customers, a community of readers and writers that have kept the store in business for well over 50 years. Uh, it's 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 such a, such a wonderful group of people. I mean, we are uh, you, many of you, probably all of you, are members of the co-op. So you're the owners of the place. You're what keeps it going. You're customers. We have to sell books if we were gonna, if we're going to survive. And you buy books from us. Um, you make suggestions. I can't think of really any change the co-op has made over the last four decades that really have not come originally from either customer suggestions or things customers said. It's really a, it, it's really a, a community effort, the cooperative and its stores. You attend author events, and many of you uh, serve on the bookstore's volunteer board of directors, a group that has really kept the co-op throughout its existence sort of focused on what's essential and what we should be doing in a bookstore in this exceptional community we're all a part of. I was thinking of just this just the other day because uh, one of the hardest decisions the co-ops board ever had to make was in 1983 when the question came up about whether we would open up another store three blocks away from the original store. Uh, and there were a lot of a lot there were a lot of issues to discuss. You're going to have to you're going to increase your space costs. You're going to increase your increase your payroll costs, your insurance costs, and everything else. And what 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 good would it do? And the good clearly was it would be able to, it would enable the co-op to do something it wasn't able to do in its original store. Um, children's books, cookbooks, mystery, science fiction, travel books, author events, the list goes on. But it wasn't really an easy decision to make. Uh, but the board made it, decided to open up 57th Street Books. We took out a $150,000 loan from the Hyde Park Bank, the first loan the co-op had ever had. And that was 30 years ago this fall. So this fall, in October, we're going to have another party celebrating 57th Street's 30th anniversary. I think the co-op is really a creation of uh, this exceptional neighborhood we're in, Hyde Park, and also this one-of-a-kind university, the University of Chicago. The, uh, there have been many people who've had very good experiences at the co-op over the years, and I, I think this has been brought home to me very strongly over the past year because two members of the co-op, Jasmine Kwong and Megan Doherty, have taken it upon themselves, they're both here, uh, to sort of document the co-op's history. They've interviewed many, many people, uh, taken probably thousands of photographs, and there's, a, there's a, an exhibit right now at Regenstein Library uh, showing a sampling of what they've done and it really, uh, I, I hadn't seen it yet until yesterday because I really didn't, I wasn't sure I wanted to go because I, it was just spectacular. It was really, uh, it, it talks about the role of bookstores in this exceptional community and the impact on the lives of many people that the, the co-op has had over the half century of its existence. So I hope you have a chance to go over and, and look at it if uh, it'll be there until mid-July 13th. Um, I think I don't. I could go on and on about the co-op, as probably some of you know, but I'm not going to go on much longer. I just uh, the next step in this process is going to be a ribbon cutting to officially open up 
the new location. And then we're going to have a party from, from now until 6 o'clock when we close. And I hope you'll all stay and celebrate that. The, the two people holding the, uh, the opposite ends of the uh, ribbon we're going to cut are both students at the, uh, at the University of Chicago um, and uh, representative of the hundreds of students at, from the university who've worked at the co-op over the last half century and really have done an awful lot to make it what it is.